Corey Locke, Special Projects Editor with Xconomy, and I'm here today with David Berry of Flagship Pioneering. Hi David, thanks for coming out. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, could you introduce, us, uh, introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about the microbiome companies that you've co-founded recently? Sure. So I'm a general partner at Flagship Pioneering. I've been with Flagship for about 12 years, uh, trained as an MD-PhD at Harvard and MIT, and have basically been uh, bit by the entrepreneurship bug and have been focusing on starting companies both before and at Flagship. Um, I focus broadly across life sciences as well as sustainability, and I guess if we had the title, I might be our uh, chief ADD officer. Mm -hmm. um, I've been interested in the microbiome as, as a field for probably about a decade. And, and the reason for this is, one, in the earliest days of this uh, for us, um, it was a really interesting area of untouched science. But what we realized very early is that the microbiome is in fact an organ that hasn't been previously appreciated. And it's easy to say in hindsight that if you had just uncovered the liver, we would have a lot of interest in figuring out what the liver might do and developing therapeutics for things that go wrong with the liver. The microbiome, because it's not characterized as an organ in the traditional sense, i.e. how tightly it's held together, um, wasn't appreciated as an organ. And now that we appreciate it, we're able to understand it, we're able to develop drugs, and frankly it's giving us complete new insights into disease. So we've been quite interested in how we can pursue that in a whole series of different avenues. And frankly, we're still in early days, so something where we see a lot of opportunity. So what's so exciting uh, about the microbiome to you? I mean, why are you so interested in um, you know, pursuing ways of developing therapeutics for the, for the microbiome? Well, the microbiome as, as a previously unappreciated organ, one has the nice benefit of being the first organ we've gotten to discover, if you will, since about the 1860s. Uh, but two, it plays central roles in a number of diseases that have proven difficult to treat uh, by more traditional approaches and more traditional targets. So for example, when one thinks about Clostridium difficile infection or potentially antibiotic associated diarrhea more broadly uh, or ulcerative colitis, these have been areas where we've had challenges coming up with treatments that can be durable, um, highly safe, r remain consistently efficacious. And I think part of that is we've been looking at only a subset of the biology. And as you get into the microbiome, you realize there is this whole other piece of the biology that we just hadn't been aware of. So our interests have been, if we can understand where this is really central, then that can be incredibly powerful. And I, I would think about it in the same way that if you were to look at something like uh, pulmonary disease, if you look at lung fibrosis, it's really important to understand the lung in order to understand that local disease. And while that example might seem absurd, if you didn't know that the lung existed, you wouldn't know how to treat fibrosis of the lung. And, and that's really where the opportunity is opening up, is just getting the rules of this organ, getting the understanding of this organ, and, and getting an understanding of what the potential impact might be. But the interesting thing is, it's not just an organ, like all organs, or just about all organs, it's part of an organ system. And that's lending itself to bigger and bigger biologies that I think we're at the cutting edge of understanding. Things like cancer, things like autoimmune disease, things like food allergy. Uh, and we're starting to see insights in how it might have connections into things like even psychiatric disorders, uh, other neurological conditions and beyond. So what is it about uh, targeting the microbiome itself that you think is going to be promising for therapeutics that some of the more traditional uh, routes of therapy haven't had much success in? Well, in the case of the microbiome, it follows certain rules of other organs or certain patterns that you see with other organs, but its substrate is different. So the reason that it is fascinating is, as opposed to being something that you can touch and has a sort of firm feeling like the liver because of the connective t tissue that holds it together, it's effectively a bunch of bacteria that have evolved or been evolved, if you will, within the context of a human to perform a certain set of reproducible functions. And it's those reproducible functions that are essential to health. What we've been able to do in some of the work we've done at companies like Ceres and Avello is, one, understand under certain first principles what ranges of health might be, but more importantly, understand when we've lost health and what that loss of health actually looks like. And in different cases, we think about different ways that we can actually treat it. So in treating the microbiome, um, we can look at treating diseases that are of the microbiome as an organ. And in those cases, you can think of the equivalent of an organ transplant. So if you have 
fibrosis of the lung, you can give a lung transplant. Um, or similarly, if you have cirrhosis of the liver, you can have a liver transplant. What's interesting though, is in some organs, you have to give the whole organ to do an effective transplant. In some organs, like the liver, you can give a very small portion of it. In the liver, it's about 10%. What we've been able to understand is what that, if you will, minimum unit is that you can transplant to reconstitute a healthy microbiome. And that allows you to basically change very quickly from the spectrum of disease to health. But also, like organs, it's part of an organ system. And understanding the other part of that organ system, the immune system, allows us to figure out how they work together. And the microbiome in this case offers a effectively privileged way to engage with the immune system. When I say privileged, I mean they've evolved together. The immune system has learned um, how the microbiome shapes. The microbiome was shaped by the immune system. And as a result, when you figure out the cues and the triggers that work in that context, you have an incredibly powerful tool to effectively naturally change the immune system. And this can unleash a degree of immune control that has just been difficult. And, and it's not to say that any other approach has been wrong, it's just that we've been able to understand previously unappreciable axes, axes of intervention that just haven't been available because we haven't been looking in the setting of the microbiome. So what does the future of microbiome medicine look to you, you know, five, ten years down the road? Like pills with specific strains of bacteria inside that you take, or what does it look like to you? Well, I think it's broad. Um, given that it is an organ, we're only now understanding what the various modalities are. So you can look at companies like Ceres, which are using consortia of organisms. Um, and that's one version of a, of a type of therapeutic. You can look at companies like Avello that's using single uh, organisms very effectively. Um, there's opportunities in using um, elements that can actually shape the microbiome. Uh, there's an emerging field where we can start understanding what are the effectors that key members of the microbiome use to drive health, or lack thereof, um, through the person, and understanding even those receptors. So I think we're going to see almost organ-unique types of therapeutics, like bacteria-based therapeutics. We're going to see um, things that feel a bit more traditional, like chemistries that can affect the microbiome or mimic or take advantage or block uh, how the microbiome affects the host. Um, and we're also starting to see some interesting new areas where people are trying to use the microbiome as almost a delivery technique. But really understanding these core biologies is central to all of it. Hmm. What do you see are the challenges of developing you know, new kinds of microbiome medicines. You know, Ceres had a phase two trial that didn't quite hit its mark. So what are some of the challenges facing these sorts of companies developing these therapeutics? Well, the, the fundamental challenge of de developing something like a bacterial-based therapeutic is it is really creating a new category of therapeutics. And one has to figure out what are the right ways to be able to develop this therapeutic? What are all the sort of standard rules that one would have to make sure you're maintaining safety? And of course, keeping patient safety first and foremost to develop a proper ethical therapeutic. Uh, that's been something that some of the companies that are pioneering in this space are really pushing forward and pushing forward in some pretty interesting ways. And, and the good news is because there are patients who are in need, um, because these are real diseases for which there are being therapeutics developed, uh, the FDA has been very keen to work with companies and figure this out in collaboration. And so I think this has been an area that has been ripe for innovation. Um, and, and the good news about any sort of first in category type company is that you're learning the field as you go. Uh, what's been interesting is even though Ceres has had some historical challenges with its phase two, um, now it's been green lighted with, with the, by the FDA to go into phase three. And um, that's, that's really because of um, the promise that's being seen and some of the understandings that uh, we've been able to get or the company's been able to get uh, around what's actually going on, what are the actual mechanisms, what does it actually mean to treat a patient uh, with a microbiome therapeutic. Um, and I think that's going to help lay the groundwork for the field going forward. So moving beyond the microbiome, what are some of the other areas that are kind of coming up next on your radar in terms of health? and? Well, the microbiome one is a, is a fascinating area. Um, it, is, it does speak pretty broadly to this notion of can we understand what, are, uh, the what is the natural world or the natural sorts of products that we engage with and how we can understand therapeutics. So looking at things like um, uh, 
amino acids and how we can use them to be able to drive health has been something we've been quite keen on. Um, reproductive medicine has been an area that we've been uh, intrigued by. It's an area that um, hasn't had enough attention paid to it historically, um, but areas where we think we can have real impacts for patients. Well, thanks for uh, offering your insights and we look forward to hearing more. Well, it's my pleasure and thanks for having me.